Hey, it's NPR's Book of the Day. I'm Andrew Limbaugh. Today, we're going to spend some time in the animal kingdom. In a bit, Atlantic writer Ed Young is on the pod talking about his new book that sort of lets us feel how animals experience the world. But first, we wanted to play for you this interview from 2010. It's between NPR's Robert Siegel and the famed biologist and conservationist E.O. Wilson, who'd just written his first fiction novel called Ant Hill. And Wilson says this really interesting thing about the nature of books and book publishing. He says, while people respect nonfiction, they read fiction, which is something important to keep in mind, especially if you're trying to do something big like save the planet. At the heart of E.O. Wilson's first novel are 70 pages that only he could have written. In those pages, the characters are ants, or more accurately, the characters are ant colonies. Professor Wilson, who is a distinguished Harvard biologist, has taught us over the years that an ant colony possesses a communal intelligence. Individuals serve limited designated purposes. The novel is called Ant Hill which is also used metaphorically to describe human society, for example, Harvard Law School. But it's the literal anthill that I confess I liked the best and kept me most closely riveted. Uh, Ed Wilson, welcome back. Thank you so much. Uh, I want you to start by telling us about war among ant colonies. You describe a sequence of wars uh, along the side of a lake in rural southern Alabama. Why does an ant colony attack another ant colony? Because it is their nature. Uh, Ants are the most warlike of all creatures, and most species, if uh, they're not at least competing with each other fiercely for resources by first come, first served, uh, they are at war with one another, and it's quite uh, natural in most species for one colony to wipe out the other if it possibly can. Your description of how a war breaks out between two ant colonies uh, reminded me of the uh, the Central American Soccer War of 1969, when, when football hooliganism led to all-out national conflict. What starts as a kind of tournament, you described, turns into wild violence. Yes, that's right. Uh, the tournaments of the ants are quite extraordinary because they come out, this is just in a small number of species that this has been described, but it's worth mentioning, and that is the, uh, the uh, soldiers come out and uh, some smaller workers accompany them, and they strut about on stilted-like uh, straightened legs and puffed-up bodies with puffed-up with air, and walk around one another and bump each other, and then counter ants from each colony goes through, sniffs each one in turn, and then reports back to the colony how strong the soldier force is. Yeah, by counter ants, you mean the ants who go out As and count. Uh, making yeah. counts, yeah. that's right. And uh, once they get a sense of who the enemy is, they're constantly sending out more more ants, or if they yes, don't have enough, right. they're... When they uh, encounter the enemy, and during the tournaments, they uh, send out more soldiers to bluff the other colony out, and the colony that gets bluffed out, uh, very much like uh, two competing human societies, retreats a little bit, and that's the uh, the payout of the game. A key difference between wars that nations fight and that anthills fight, uh, you observe, is that uh, we, people, send our young males to war. They send their old females to war. Exactly. All ants that you see, all of the members of the colony that actually work with the queen, are female. I think most people would say that's uh, not bad, although others might say that's liberalism run amok. <laughs> <laughs> but but the, role, the, role, the role of the male ants is like, a, it's like terminal permanent adolescence. Uh, their only oh. object is to have sex, and after they do that once, they're finished. Not only that, uh, they're only uh, brought into existence, that is, raised up as males uh, for a short season in most kinds of ants, and they don't do anything. They're taken care of by their sisters, and then they they are released on the big day when they get a chance to mate with a virgin queen in the air, and then they die. And goodbye. Now, the stories of the ant wars in your, in your book, Ant Hill, are set within a story about the contemporary South. It actually, actually mm-hmm. spans three generations of, of Southerners. story about class distinction, uh, but also about conservation and, and development. How do you see, I mean, you're, you've, you've written before about ants and about science, now you've, you've tried a novel. What role do the ants have in the, in the broader story as you, as you see it? I feel, as many of my fellow conservationists do, that we still haven't made as much of an imprint uh, on public opinion as is deserved. And so I observe 
that whereas people respect nonfiction, they read novels. Mm -hmm. So this was one of the motivation I had for converting what I know and then having, I hope, not too obvious an environmental message in, uh, in the form of a, uh, of a story. So the ants in the novel join me in uh, making this effort because ants are the most abundant of all insects. They are the most social. And uh, <clears throat> they're also, I think, to most people, most humans, the most interesting. So they are there to represent the ecosystem in an interesting and compelling, I hope, compelling yeah. way. So here you have in the in the novel there are uh, uh, people mm -hmm. who are differing or struggling over how to develop attractive mm -hmm. land, and we as readers have been exposed to a, a whole mm -hmm. civilization uh, that unfolded in the course of months on the shore of that lake among ant colonies, uh, the the equivalent of a century full of continental wars taking place. Right? Uh, yes, it's the Iliad in four years. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, actually, the Iliad didn't uh, take uh, longer than that either, did it? I didn't. It, that part didn't even occur to me actually until I was well into the writing that I was writing something of a six-legged Iliad. <laughs> your 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 protagonist, uh, Raph Sems Cody, uh, is from South Alabama, and he falls in love with nature as a little kid, mm -hmm. and uh, never falls out of love uh, with nature. You're you're from Mobile yourself. Uh, mm -hmm. is, is, is your fascination with ants today just in a direct continuation of uh, the little kid digging in the, in, in, in the sand and looking uh, at these creatures? Oh, yes, it is. Every kid has a bug period. I just never grew out of mine. But basically, I, I'd like people to strike some kind of a, a balance in between the poor urban kid that never knows what's going on in the real world outside of uh, his computer and TV screens at one extreme, and then perhaps the person that becomes a virtual recluse in nature. We really need to have our kids getting out long enough for them to develop a deep interest in and perhaps love for the wild lands remaining to us. What 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 was Mobile like uh, when you first remember experiencing it, and uh, when was that? Mobile was a small city, and it was within uh, within easy reach. Were uh, wonderful natural environments from marshland to pine forests, relatively undisturbed, and rivers and streams. And that's where I went out as a boy, constantly exploring. And that's where I learned a lot on my own and uh, became, I think, committed at, for a lifetime to studying the natural world in this, this manner I started there. You've written about ants for many years and, and in Ant Hill once again. Now you're writing about people as well in this, in this book. Or, uh, which, which do you prefer? Or are the people more interesting than the ants or, or vice versa? People. That'll surprise you. <laughs> but next to people, ants. E.O. Okay. E. Wilson, thank you very much <laughs> thank you. for talking with us. E.O. Uh, Wilson, Pulitzer Prize winning uh, biologist and now the author of a novel. It is called Ant Hill. There was this series of books I used to read as a kid. It was called Animorphs by K.A. Applegate, and it followed these kids who gained the power to turn into any animal they touched. And sometimes when one of them turned into, say, an ant or a bat or a dog or whatever, they'd freak out from the sensory overload of being in the world in a different way. Listening to this interview between NPR's Aisha Roscoe and Atlantic writer Ed Young, whose book An Immense World is all about these different ways of being in the world, I feel like maybe those kids weren't freaking out enough. Sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. Those are senses through which most humans experience the world. But a large swath of the animal world perceives the world in radically different ways. 
like fish that see through electroreceptors scattered throughout their bodies, or fire-chasing beetles that can sense heat nearly 100 miles away through tiny sensors behind their middle legs. Science journalist Ed Yong gives us a glimpse into these wonders in his book, An Immense World, How Animal Senses Reveal the Hidden Realms Around Us. He's also a writer for The Atlantic, and he joins us now. Welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Under the concept of Umwelt, which is German for environment, much of the book focuses on how animals see the world. Um, I can say, like, before reading this book, I had never really thought about that. Yeah, uh, you, you've got it exactly right. Umwelt uh, comes from the German word from environment, but it doesn't mean the physical surroundings of, of a, a creature. It means its sensory world, the unique blend of sights and sounds and textures and other stimuli that it has access to. So, for example, um, there are rattlesnakes that can sense the infrared radiation given off by warm-blooded animal prey. Dolphins and bats can hear sounds that are much more high-pitched than what our ears can detect. And they make those sounds to perceive the world in the rebounding echoes. A lot of creatures perceive the world in a different way than we do. If all those animals were in the same room as me now, if somehow I had a rattlesnake and a dolphin and a bat and all the rest with me here, we would be existing in the same physical space but we would all have a radically different experience of that shared reality. What would your dogs like Umwelt be compared to, you know, your sense of the world? Full of smell. When we walk down the street, there will always be moments when my dog Typo will grind to a halt and explore some super interesting patch of pavement that just looks completely nondescript to me. To him, it abounds with interesting scent. Dogs that have walked past in the street before us, um, you know, he can sense, um, you know, people, he knows round corners before I can see them arriving. And to him, these streets are constantly changing. They're full of new information, even though to my eyes, they seem constant and mundane. I mean, that's what I, I kind of got from reading the book. You write extensively about uh, color. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, so for us, a rainbow exists from red to violet. Uh, for some other animals, it's even more limited. So for my dog, Typo, it goes from yellows to blues with whites and greys in between. If you can see ultraviolet as a bee can, then flowers look very different. A sunflower, rather than just being uniform yellow, has a vivid ultraviolet bullseye at its centre that lures insects towards it. Fish. Different species look identical, but some have markings on their face in ultraviolet that make it look like they have got running mascara. Birds see, you know, about 100 times more colors likely than, than we can perceive. You have a chapter on pain, and there's still a lot of debate and research over whether certain animals or creatures can feel pain. Can you tell me more about that? The questions about whether animals feel pain or not are, of course, um, of immense ethical importance. But just the nature of that question is limiting. It treats the answer as yes or no, whereas, as we know from other senses, the animal world is incredibly varied. And it's very likely that a lot of other creatures, from fish to crustaceans, can feel a kind of pain that's going to be different than what we experience, but still exists. So consider squid and octopuses. These are two related creatures. They both belong to the group of animals called cephalopods. But their experience of pain is very different. If you wound a squid on part of its body, it probably doesn't know exactly where the injury is. It has this hypersensitivity that affects its entire body, which is weird, right? It's like it's as if you stubbed your toe and suddenly like your arm or your head would hurt. An octopus, it seems to have a, a understanding of pain that is more localized. If it bruises one of its arms, it will caress and nuzzle that arm much like I might caress a finger that's burnt. Do you think that that should change, like, human decisions? 
Yeah, I think that there are many areas actually where trying to understand the umwelt、um, of other creatures and trying to think about their senses would lead us to make better decisions. We talked about dogs and the way they smell. So many dog owners spend a lot of time yanking their dogs away from things that they're sniffing. Owners treat walks as simply a means of exercise, but walks are also a means of exploration. And I think if you drag dogs away from From using their primary sense, it affects their psychology. They become less happy, more anxious. The most dramatic example of this, where I talk about the problem of sensory pollution, we have flooded the world with light and with sound. They can be highly detrimental to a lot of other animals. They can drown out the sounds that they use to communicate. They can lure animals. Into traps, like in, like literally, like moths to a flame. They can mi- waylay migrating birds, or you know, distract swimming whales. We're not used to thinking of these things as pollutants. Was there anything that you were really surprised to learn when you were researching this book? And did you have maybe a couple of favorites that you really enjoyed, like finding out more about? Oh, I've got. I mean, I've got so many, and it's really hard to pick between them.、Um, there's a whole chapter in the book about heat and animals' experience about heat. You know, I, I held this hibernating ground squirrel that simply doesn't feel cold or hot in the at the same temperatures that we feel cold or hot. You know, if I asked you the question. Is ice cold? The answer would obviously be yes, but actually the answer is well, no, for some animals because their senses have calibrated their experience of hot and cold at very different thresholds. Which is why you know a camel can exist in a baking desert and be fine, or a penguin can exist in in the middle of in the Antarctic and be fine. To me, it seems like this is, in a way, very humbling for humans.、Mm-hmm. And is that ultimately what you want readers to take away from this book? Yeah, that, that's one of several things.、Um, but but it's certainly core to it. It's very easy to be narcissistic about our place as a species in this planet. But I think the idea that even we are only getting a very thin slice of what、um, the animal kingdom as a whole perceives. Is a blow to that ego. I think it shows us that we are just one among many equals in the natural world. But I also hope that the book sparks curiosity to learn more about those sensory worlds. I hope it sparks a bit of empathy with our fellow creatures.、Um, you know, I think it is a profound act. Of empathy to try and put yourself in the perspective of someone or something else with a radically different experience of the world than you, and I think that's a muscle we should try and build and flex more often. Science journalist Ed Yong, his book "An Immense World" is out this week. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. That's it for this week on NPR's Book of the Day. If you want more, you can sign up for our newsletter at npr.org/newsletter/books. I'm Andrew Limbong. The podcast is produced by Miranda Mazariegos and Nina Rao, and edited by Megan Sullivan. Our founding editor is Petra Mayer. The show elements for this week were produced and edited by Matt Ozug, Courtney Dorning, Jan Stewart, Melissa Gray, Jana Dujung Lee, Jessica Mendoza, Emiko Tamagawa, Todd Munt, Bilal Qureshi, Corey Turner, Andrew Craig, and Dee Parvaz. Beth Donovan is our managing editor. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.